Hey, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. It is 2 p.m., so we are going to go ahead and get started. We have advanced birding today with Mr. Brian Magnier, and he is a naturalist and a biologist, and we're super excited to have him back. This is kind of a part two of a program that we did earlier in the year. Um, my name is Julia Myers. I'll be your host this afternoon, and we're coming to you live from the Brooker Creek Preserve Environmental Education Center. Our program today is sponsored by our friends group, the Friends of Brooker Creek Preserve. So we wanna give a big thank you to our friends group for supporting our programming here. And if you're interested in learning more about the friends or even becoming a member, you can check them out at thefriendsofbrookercreekpreserve.org. And we are just about to get started. If you've got any questions throughout the program today, feel free to use the Q&A box at any point through the program and we'll be sure to answer all of your questions at the end. And if you just have general comments, um, then you can go ahead and use the chat box for that. And I think we are good to go. So without further ado, welcome, Brian. Thank you so much for being here with us today. Hi, yeah, thank you for having me again. Um, so yeah, so today's talk is going to be, again, kind of an advanced birding sort of talk. Um, if you were here for the first round of advanced birding, it was quite a few months back at this point, um, this will cover a lot of the same topics, you know, so if you, if you missed that, then, you know, you'll get a lot of the same information, but we are going to kind of move a little bit faster through some of the, uh, the same topics that we did last time so that we can then get to a little bit of new stuff um, so that, you know, people who were here last time will definitely get to see a bunch of new information, new pictures, things like that. Um, so the main, the outline for what we're going to do today um, looks very similar to last time. We're going to talk about, you know, why we like birds, you know, why to study birds or why go birding. A little bit about uh, phylogeny, a little bit of bird anatomy, some molt, um, a little bit about bird migration and what habitats uh, might be around in Central Florida to find birds in. Um, and then we'll kind of shift from the ornithology side of things, the anatomy and the phylogeny, and we'll go kind of more to the field aspect, the birding aspect into um, kind of how to start identifying birds, how to find them um, and figure out what you're looking at once you do find them. Um, and so we'll look at flight patterns of birds, a little bit of birding by ear, um, and talk a little bit about eBird and kind of one of the, that's one of the best ways to figure out what birds are around in your area. Um, and then we'll move kind of through um, the eBird stuff and go on to tricky species, which is where we're going to spend a, a lot of our time today because the tricky species that we're going to talk about a lot are going to be those pesky fall migrants. Uh, and wintering birds that are often not in their nice colorful breeding plumage. Um, it also includes a lot of those shorebirds and they can look really similar. Um, and so we'll spend a bit of time trying to kind of pick our way through some of those birds that you're definitely going to see if you go out there in the next couple of months. So to start off, why do we, why do we like birds? You know, I like birds, but you know, people like to study birds um, but why do we get interested in birds? It seems like, you know, there's probably more people out there interested in birds, um, you know, as a hobby viewing birds and birding than say going to try and find like salamanders or fish, um, maybe small mammals. Um, and I think one of the big reasons why we really like to study birds, first of all, is the diversity of colors, the diversity of shapes and sizes, um, you know, everything from the little bee hummingbird all the way up into giant storks and ostriches. Um, but I really think that the reason the birds are kind of the gateway into natural history where, you know, everybody kind of starts out enjoying and observing birds is because of the level of diversity that there are, that there is in birds. Uh, for birds, there are about 10,000 species globally, which is a lot, you know, it's really, it'd be difficult to try and learn the names of every single one of those species. But pretty much anywhere you go on the planet, there's about a hundred species of birds to be seen and enjoyed. Um, in the tropics, there's more, up near the poles, there's less. But in general, there's kind of a, a graspable number of birds um, that you can, you can learn and identify. You know, if you were to try and get into something like insects, you know, beetles, you know, there's tens of thousands of types of beetles, even in just Florida alone, there's thousands of species of beetles. It'd, it'd be overwhelming to try and learn, you know, that whole group of organisms. And so birds are kind of this, this sweet spot where there's not too much diversity so that it's overwhelming, 
Um, but there's enough to keep you interested. You know, there's always more birds to see, you know, that you haven't seen yet. Um, and so I think that's one of the big reasons why birds are so universally loved and watched and enjoyed, um, just because they fall in that nice sweet spot. Now, one of the ways that we do enjoy birds is by kind of classifying them. It's like a treasure hunt when we go look for birds. And to really understand how and why we classify birds, we have to look, take a quick look at phylogeny. And so this is kind of the evolutionary relationships between different birds. And so we've got uh, birds as a whole kind of broken down into orders and then families. And so the family level um, is where we're really gonna kind of focus trying to identify birds too. So uh, one family of birds is the owls. Another would be the hummingbirds, um, you know, the new world wood warblers. These are all different families of birds and they kind of break down, you know, that 10,000 species of birds into these manageable chunks. And if you take a given area, let's say you're at Burker Creek Preserve, and you see a bird and you know that it's in the kind of heron and egret family. You know, it's this big wading bird. It's got the right shape. You can identify it to that family. Now you've only got, you know, maybe a dozen species of birds to look through in your field guide to identify what exact species you're dealing with. So um, by categorizing birds as these different families that are closely related, it makes it a lot easier to try to, try to study them and try to identify them. And we'll keep that in mind uh, for later on down the line. When we go through tricky species, one of the first steps is going to be trying to make sure you know kind of what family the bird is that you're looking at. And then we'll figure out how to identify them further. And the way to identify them, one of the big ways is by looking at their anatomy, kind of their physical structure, their plumage. Um, and so it kind of, it's important to keep track of the different feather tracts of birds. Um, because you know, if you look at a field guide and it says, oh, this one can be identified from this guy over here because it has black primaries versus white primaries, then you know, you know which type of feathers you're looking at here. The primaries are kind of those fingery wing feathers. And so it, it can help to have a general understanding of the different uh, feather tracts of birds just to be able to more easily identify them. Of course, these feather tracks, they change over time, not necessarily the locations of the tracks, but you know, the feathers in each spot will change because birds molt. Um, and so birds will, be, will look different uh, when they first hatch, and then they quickly molt from kind of their downy hatching sort of plumage into their first uh, plumage, which is generally called the juvenile plumage, um, which is generally kind of their summertime plumage right after they hatch. Often birds will look very drab because they're kind of trying to hide from predators. Maybe they're still in the nest. And then they kind of, some birds will molt into uh, kind of their first winter plumage after the fall of that first year. It's a little bit different for some birds. Some birds kind of stay more juvenile plumage later. Some molt out of it very quickly. But the big thing to consider for this time of year for birding, especially in Florida, is that a lot of the birds are going to be molting from either juvenile plumage to adult plumage or from their breeding plumage into their fall and winter plumage, which can look drastically different. And that can make identifying birds in the field a bit tougher because it's not just you know, one search image that you have to have in your brain for each species. There might be you know, a breeding plumage male, a breeding you know, female, juveniles, and then kind of these intermediate stages with different levels of molt or winter plumage. And so you can have five or six different things, all being technically the same species. And that's going to be one thing that is a bit tricky um, when you're trying to identify birds, especially in the fall, um, because those nice colorful warblers that everybody loves in the spring, a lot of them look a lot more drab and a lot more similar come fall and winter. So here's one example of a bird that changes, you know, throughout the year. We've got probably the most easily misidentified bird um, in Florida, I would say, is an immature or juvenile little blue heron, which is pure white here, looks just like an egret. And we'll talk later on how to identify between the two of them, uh, because that is one of those ones that is common um, to see, but it can be a little bit tricky to tell it apart. 
But yeah, so the white juvenile plumage of the little blue heron um, in the fall and winter, it'll kind of go through this weird ghostly change where it switches uh, from being white that first year, you know, it's hatch year in the summer and fall to uh, kind of having this cool, like smoky, dark bluish steel color. I just love the intermediate little blue heron color. And you'll see that on some individuals kind of in the winter into the spring. Uh, and then they settle on this final adult plumage where they're kind of got this little maroonish purple neck and head into the blue, blue gray back. Um, but so these birds are molting all of their feathers and changing kind of from, from looking like one thing to another. And that can be a little bit tough to keep track of. Um, but again, we'll talk about those tricky species uh, later on down the line. But why, why do birds molt? I guess, you know, that's one question you might have right off the bat. Why are they getting rid of their feathers? Why are they changing colors? And so the thing with birds is that they need their feathers most, you know, most obviously to fly. Uh, their wings are not made up of skin like a bat's wing. Their wings are pretty much made up of these feathers. And so they need these feathers to be in tip top shape to be able to actually fly and glide. And so if a feather gets worn or broken or just too old and eventually falls out, they need to molt those feathers. They need to regrow them. And so here you can see a, a wing with little budding feathers. And in this wood stork, you can see kind of he's regrowing one of his primaries here. And they can't do that all at once because then they wouldn't be able to fly. You need at least some of your feathers. And so generally the wing feathers, they kind of molt out sequentially along the wing. Um, and the body feathers will also kind of sometimes look a little bit patchy when they're molting out. Um, they can't, you know, like I said, they can't do them all at once like insects, you know, grasshopper, this grasshopper here, this little um, lubber grasshopper that can be very common in Florida. You know, they go from a non-flying juvenile and then they just molt their whole skin off. They, you know, they molt their whole exoskeleton and then boop, they have wings. And then now they can fly perfectly. Birds, they, they can't do that. They need their feathers for insulation. They need them to be able to, to fly, to hunt, to get away from predators. So birds kind of do this um, where, you know, just kind of sequentially, they molt all of their feathers. And the way they do this though, it's very energy intensive. It's really cool on a cell cellular level. Um, you know, there's all these interesting ways where it kind of the cells will grow into almost something like a hair and then it pops out into these feathers and it, uh, we can go into that more at the end if people really want to, but the, the main gist of the idea here is that it takes a lot of energy to grow these big, amazing structures that are feathers. And when it takes this much energy and time, you don't want to be, um, you know, trying to migrate or trying to uh, feed your young at the same time that you are molting. And so if you look at this cool graph of the breeding season in this, this gray, there's a kind of a bell curve here of the breeding season of some birds. And then you look at that compared to when birds want to be molting, the molting season generally starts right after the breeding season. You know, birds, they've laid their eggs, they've raised their chicks, they're done with kind of, you know, that toddler stage where they just kind of constantly have to be feeding the babies. And now the babies are kind of starting to leave the nest and the parents can kind of take a breath finally. You know, it's late summer, kick the kids out of the house and now finally they can start shedding some of their feathers and molting. So a lot of birds will molt, they'll kind of ramp up molting starting right here at the end of the breeding season. Um, and so those birds would have a totally new plumage come fall. And so some of them might uh, have, you know, they might look very different than they did during the breeding season. Other birds uh, actually wait until they get to their wintering grounds to molt. You know, they'll have their breeding season, and then they'll fly all the way down to Florida, to the Caribbean, uh, to South America. And then once they get down there, that's when they decide, okay, I'm in the tropics. I'm just going to kick back with all of my, you know, plentiful food. And then I'm going to molt all my feathers out right now. So there's some little bits of, you know, some differences there. But in general, birds want to avoid molting their feathers during those two really energetically um, important times, the migration and during the breeding season. So speaking of migration, um, you know, we, there's a lot of birds that move all over the country and it can be a little bit tough to keep track of which ones are where. 
Uh, but this will be my first kind of plug to go check out eBird if you haven't as a, uh, a platform to figure out what birds are in your area. This is a chart of you know, what birds are present based on the little green bars during different months. Here we're going left to right kind of across a year, January through December here. And this is data for Florida. So this is um, data that, you know, general, you know, the general public birders, um, they're putting into eBird and saying, oh, I saw these birds, you know, and this many of them on these days. And based on that, you can make these really cool little charts of when birds are passing through um, Florida. And so here you can identify the main, the bulk of migration in the spring and the fall for different species. We've got, you know, Cape May warblers in Florida. They're only seen April and May, and then September, October, November. Otherwise, you're pretty much never gonna see a Cape May warbler. Uh, whereas Northern Perulas, you know, you can see they're there all year round. Uh, so they actually breed in Florida. You can see them right now, you can see them you know, six months from now. Whereas the Cape, you know, for the Cape May warbler, you'd be lucky if you see one straggler on their way down south right now. And so this can be a really nice tool to figure out what birds are migrating. The other tool, the classic tool to figure out what birds are migrating is, you know, just kind of a, a map in a field guide. You know, this is kind of the standard uh, range map for uh, here, a yellow rumped warbler. And we can see that in the summertime in orange, they're breeding up here in Canada and New England. Uh, the yellow is kind of, they only pass through during migration. And then this winter uh, range here in blue is pretty much all the Southern half of the US and you know, all of Central America. And so right now these yellow rumped warblers can be seen in Florida just based on this map here. Um, and so these maps in field guides are a really good way to kind of study and learn what, what to expect out there. But how, so these are huge distances though, and that's a tiny, tiny little bird. So how the heck are they migrating that whole, you know, the whole country? And without going too far into it, because I, you know, I think we went into more about navigation and migration in a previous talk. Um, we're going to look, you know, here, just a quick overview of how birds navigate. Um, and they do it actually with like all the different possible ways you can think of, and then even a few that we can barely even imagine. So they use landmarks, you know, birds often will fly down to the coast. They see that they're at the, you know, at the Atlantic Ocean and they'll just, okay, keep my, keep the Atlantic on your left and fly until you reach Florida and then stop and then you're done. Um, you know, or fly until it gets warm or fly until there's food. You know, there's different, you know, there might be different triggers as to why um, birds stop where they do. Um, another thing besides just landmarks like a mountain range or the coast, birds like to use um, the geomagnetic compass. They kind of have an internal compass where they can actually sense different magnetic fields of the earth and they can orient themselves, you know, either going north or going south, depending on the season, just using um, the, the earth's magnetism. Uh, they can use this position of the sun, you know, where it's setting, uh, where it's rising, where it is, uh, what direction it's at when it's at its highest. Um, and then at night, you know, a lot of birds migrate at night. Um, they, you know, they'll fly all night and then they might stop during the day to eat. And so at night you can't use the sun's direction to navigate. So you actually use the stars and they, it's been shown with really cool experiments by putting birds in planetariums and watching which direction they try to migrate. If you switch the sky so that the North star is in the wrong spot, they'll migrate in the wrong direction um, because they are somehow aware of you know, how the stars are rotating. Another cool thing that birds use um, that is no longer really a sense that we have as humans is polarized light or plain polarized light. Uh, this is kind of a way to tell where the sun is, even if it's like cloudy out, you know, the angle of the light bouncing off of uh, water or clouds, it has different polarization angles and the birds can actually detect this and use it to navigate. Um, and then another couple of things that they use that are a little bit less well-known, but it's, it's been shown with experiments that they do use them are infrasound and smell. And so imagine you can smell the ocean. Like if you're driving, you're on a beach day, you're driving, you can smell being near the coast, you know, before you can see it. And so that, that can be an important way um, if a landmark is too far to actually see visually, they use smell. And the infrasound is like deep, loud sounds. 
So wind hitting mountain ranges, uh, waves hitting the coast, things like that. These are sounds that the birds can actually detect from you know, possibly tens or dozens of miles away from the source. And they can use that kind of to feed into this mental map that they have of where they're migrating. So that's enough of kind of the ornithology side. You've got a background of ornithology. We talked a little bit about, you know, we, we group birds together into families and that's phylogeny and their evolutionary background. And, you know, a little bit about anatomy and molt and things like that. But now let's take it out into the field and leave those, you know, the books behind and let's go. We walk outside in Florida. And the first thing we have to notice if we're gonna try and find and identify birds is the habitat. Where are we? What are the plants around? What's the kind of the elevation? Is there water? Is there not water? Um, so, you know, there will be different types of birds found around this sort of palmetto scrub habitat, which, you know, might have scrub jays or night jars and things like that. Then you will find around mangroves where you're going to find things like ibis and wading birds. Um, and then if you, you know, here's, uh, at the boardwalk at Brooker Creek, we've got kind of a forest and swamp combo. This is a really good spot to find a lot of songbirds because there's a lot of bugs, which is, you know, a lot of food, um, for little songbirds that are either migrating through or wintering. And so if you ask me, you know, where to go to try and find things like warblers and vireos, you know, the, the boardwalk at Brooker Creek would be a, a good spot to check this time of year. And of course, you've got, you know, open water. Florida has no sh shortage of water. This would be a great place to, to find all of your wading birds, all of your herons, things like that, including some of my favorites, the skulky little hiding secret ones, the least bittern here. Um, this is, it's a really cool bird to try and find because um, it's unlike, you know, the great blue heron and the great egret, which are in the same family, you know, they're kind of the same body plan, same shape. Um, but the great blue heron and great egret, they just stick out. They stand out there in the middle of a pond. They don't care who sees them. This guy, the least bittern, he's a bit more shy. And so it's kind of, it's a treat when you get to glimpse one. Um, and you can often find them hiding in kind of grassy, cattaily, marshy sort of areas. Um, areas like Circle B, uh, Bar Reserve. This one was just kind of at a uh, little retention pond behind my old apartment in Tampa. So you're in the right habitat. You know, you're looking for different birds out here and you see something and maybe the first bird you see is out on the horizon just flying away from you. The first way to start figuring out what you're seeing is to note how it's flying. Is it a big bird soaring in the air? You know, maybe it's not flapping at all. That might give you a clue that it's like a vulture or a hawk. You know, these, these large raptors and scavengers will often soar uh, without flapping very much. And they'll be very visible, just kind of sitting up there way in the sky, hovering. Um, and so maybe that would be more likely a raptor than some little songbird, uh, which would be flapping a lot, maybe doing a little bit of an up and down undulating flight. Um, so if you see a bird that kind of is flying like this in kind of a sine wave, be more likely something like a goldfinch or a woodpecker. They often fly with those sort of flap, 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 and then glide and flap, 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 glide. Um, and then there are other birds that are very flappy, but they fly in straight lines. Uh, think of maybe like a hummingbird at the at one extreme, um, you know, compared to the vultures that never flap. If you see a hummingbird, you know it's a hummingbird just by the way it's flying because its wings are beating so fast you can't even see them. The wings are making this buzzing sound and it just kind of zips straight by, usually in a straight line. Um, and so that's that's kind of the first clue to identifying birds out in the field is how is it flying? Kind of take note of, is it flapping often and how big is it? Stuff like that. The next thing you'll probably notice are a lot of birds like to kind of be very vocal. <laughs> um, some of them will yell their name if they were named onomatopoetically, uh, onomatopoetically uh, which is very helpful. You know, things like whippoorwills and chuckwills widows, they basically just scream their name all night long. It's pretty easy to identify them by ear. Uh, a lot of other birds are not as easy to identify by ear. Um, you know, lots of little whistles and buzzes and chirps and things like that. Um, but, and it can be kind of uh, intimidating trying to break down that many um, different species. 
Um, if you go out in the woods and you hear 10 or 20 different things all at once, it can be really tough to try and figure out what you're listening to. But I would say, here's the first thing I would do. First big tip is these 10 species for Florida. These are the ones I want you to learn. If you want to drastically improve your ability to identify birds in the field, and you can't really identify things by ear at the moment, I'd say this is the biggest step um, going from, you know, kind of a more casual birder up to those, those mythical expert birders who just know all the birds around all the time and can pick them out without even looking. This is the biggest jump in the ability in birding, I would say, is being able to identify a significant portion of the sound around you, because then you can be looking at a different bird. You can be looking, you know, tying your shoes. You can be looking at a snake or a flower, and you'll still be aware of all the different species that are around you. And these 10 species are, I'd say, the most common and most vocal species in the state. And so if you just learn these 10 species, their calls, um, then you will have a much easier time picking out the weird ones, you know, because then when something that's not on this list inevitably starts singing, you'll be able to recognize that that's a bit different. You know, you know, that's odd. It's not one of these common species that you're used to hearing. The sounds can also be really, really helpful for the more cryptic species, things that are um, either nocturnal, like the owls, or maybe just really, really hidden in the marshes, like rails. Uh, here we've got a Virginia rail and a Sora. And then the most common owls to see in Florida be barred and great horned. Um, and so if you can learn their calls and sounds, then that'll be a huge jump in just your ability to find um, and locate different species. And one way to visualize these sounds, let's say you're outside and you hear something and you don't know what it is, you can actually kind of write down what the sound looks like with this sort of um, little like spectrogram sort of thing. And so here, high pitched sounds would be up high, low pitched sounds would be down low, and the kind of the boldness or the color here indicates the volume. And so here, this would be this sort of um, spectrogram or spectrograph of um, a bird song. And here, if we kind of, you know, just look at it, you can see it goes And that might actually be a familiar sound because that would be the, the spectrogram for the Northern Cardinal. It's kind of one of those really common birds. It's on my list of 10 back there um, that I think would be very useful to know. Um, and so some resources uh, to go learn some of the sounds, um, xenocanto.org, all about birds, which is run by Cornell. And then if you want like um, tapes or like a downloaded thing that you could put on your phone to listen to in the car, the Stokes Field Guides uh, to Bird Songs are a really good way to kind of start learning uh, all these different sounds. Okay, so you know how to identify some of these birds. You, you know, you kind of know what habitats are in your area. Now you want to figure out what birds are around and, you know, how to go find them and just kind of, you know, you don't want to have to pick through 10,000 birds uh, to identify the one that's in your backyard. And so that is where I would say go to ebird.org here and look at um, different maps. They've got species maps where you can look up one bird. Let's say here, we wanna look up the purple gallinule and all of these spots are places where people have seen purple gallinules and the orange ones are places where people have seen them in, last, in the last month or so. And so this is a really good way if you have a tar kind of a targeted approach, you want to identify and see one species, then use this, the species maps sort of uh, tab but then you can also go the other route and go to the hotspots and say, okay, I wanna to go to Brooker Creek and I don't know what birds to expect there, especially this time of year. So you pull up the hotspots and you go and click on Brooker Creek here. And then it'll tell you a list of all the species that have been there. And it's generally organized by the things that have been seen most recently up top. And so here we can kind of get a sense of which birds have been seen there in just the last couple of weeks. And so if you go, you know kind of what to expect. But if you go and you only focus on, you know, what birds other people have seen, then that introduces a little bit of sample bias because, you know, what if there's a rare bird 
um, and you kind of just write it off as something common because nobody else has reported it. You know, you see this weird warbler, but you're like, oh, it's probably just a palm warbler, you know, the most common warbler that's around. But, you know, there's this kind of bias there where if everybody is reporting one thing, it can be difficult to kind of piece through that data and see, um, you know, what's actually what's real and what's just kind of, oh, everybody's going to the same spot. And so it looks like there's a bunch of species there. Um, but if you know, nobody's reporting from right across the street, but there's actually the same, the same species are over there too. And that, that just kind of gets, it gets a little bit tricky. Um, but in general, you can think of uh, the places that are the most easily accessible are gonna have more species on their lists here in eBird, just because more people go there and they're sampled more often. So here, a good example of that is this Honeymoon Island State Park, probably one of the most diverse um, sort of birdy sort of places on the west half of Florida here. Um, there's like, you know, 300 species of birds have been seen there. And then if you go one little island to the north here, habitat-wise, size-wise, these are probably pretty comparable islands. I would be willing to bet there's almost exactly the same species on both, but there's way fewer species reported um, up north here because you need a boat to get to some of these keys. Whereas Honeymoon Island down here has a nice bridge, nice causeway, so it's easy to get to. And so this is where what I was saying about the sample bias can really kind of take effect. Um, don't assume that just because a location has fewer birds on eBird, don't assume that that means it actually doesn't have very many birds. Uh, it might just be tougher to get to or fewer people you know, go there in general. But I digress. Um, the other thing to be aware of if you're out, you know, looking for birds um, is are the ones that aren't native. You know, there's escapees, vagrants, and introduced species. And so some of these you're very familiar with, I'm sure. Um, everybody has seen starlings from Europe. You know, people have seen collared doves. Um, but where this can get a little bit tricky is if there's a bird that's totally out of left field and it's like the first time it's shown up and you don't know if it's something that's been blown in. Uh, from the Caribbean by a hurricane, or if it's brought in because it was somebody's pet and it just escaped, you know, and so that's kind of the, uh, the story with this bird here, the brown back solitaire. Um, this is a little bit of a tangent because this is not from Florida. This is a bird that I saw in Southeast Arizona, um, but this bird was, you know, singing in this canyon and me and a bunch of other birders, we heard this sound and we knew just right away it was not native. It was, or it was not a local bird. This is a sound that none of us had recognized at all. And we figured we had to find this bird. And one of my friends had um, downloaded the bird songs of Mexico on his iPhone. And so he was go going through the, the kind of these songs of Mexican birds, even though we were in Arizona and he clicked on the brown back solitaire and it was the same exact sound. And we're like, wow, this bird has never been seen in North America before. We need to find this bird, take its picture and see if we can kind of tell if it's somebody's pet that's maybe escaped. You know, birds with really nice songs are often part of the pet trade. Um, or if this is actually a vagrant, uh, something that has moved from its sort of main habitat down in the central highlands of Mexico up to Southeast Arizona of its own accord. And birders get really excited over vagrants because um, it's just, you know, these are birds that are usually not in our area. Uh, just by definition, they're kind of, um, they've blown in or uh, gotten lost or confused and they just kind of spread or dispersed into um, a new country or state where they're not often seen. And this brown back solitaire here, um, it's got these really nice primaries. They're not worn, they're not molting. That was lucky. Um, and pet birds, because they're you know, kept in cages, often those primaries will be very worn or bent because the feathers will be hit against the side of the cage. And so this picture, with these nice clean feathers that kind of proved, oh, okay, we think this bird is actually a wild bird. So if you're out birding and you see something really weird, you know, try and get some pictures of it because later on down the line, we might be, you might be able to prove that this was actually like the first record for Florida or something like that. So with that, that's kind of mostly where, you know, advanced birding part one kind of ended uh, when we uh, talked last time. But here we're gonna focus a bit more for the rest of the um, time. We're gonna focus on what birds to expect and then how to identify them in winter and migration. Um, so the 
The big things to expect um, in winter are going to be an influx of songbirds from the north, like this palm warbler, which is probably one of the most common species of birds you'll see in the winter. And these wading birds, many of which were there all year, uh, but some of them will move down into Florida and some of them will just kind of get more visible. They're not breeding anymore. They're all out feeding. You know, the young ones that were nest, um, in nests all summer, they're now out uh, in lagoons and on the beach as well. And so you'll notice more wading birds. And then the other guys that migrate down, uh, just like the songbirds, are shorebirds. Um, and so you'll often find things like sandpipers and plovers um, on the beaches, more so in the winter than in the summer. And this is where we're going to start our tricky species categories, because those shorebirds, there are a lot of species of them, and identifying them to species can be really, really tricky. Um, we've got a lot of different size categories. We've got little, you know, different shapes. What do we look at to try and identify these things? A lot of them are just going to be little brown dots out on the beach. Um, and so here, you know, I'm not necessarily going to go through every single species that's possible and how to identify it. That would be a very long list with a lot of pictures. Um, but what we're going to do is take these different categories, the shorebirds, the wading birds, some of the songbirds, and we're going to kind of figure out what are the exact questions we need to ask to identify them. So that way you can take your own bird out in the wild and you can look at it and you can know what, what questions to ask to start getting an ID. I think that's a little bit more useful than just trying to show you 40 different species of shorebirds and going through all the field marks for every single one. You know, you can do that at home with, a, with your own field guide. So the first thing that I want you to do to try and identify your shorebirds is figure out how big it is. This will be the first thing. You'll break it into these categories. Is it small? You know, most of them are kind of these small little sandpipers, but then there's some that are kind of a little bit bigger black-bellied plovers um, and golden plovers, um, but also dowagers and willets. These are kind of these medium-sized shorebirds. And then there's some really big ones. Mostly you've got things like this godwit here um, and you know things like curlews. They can be very large. And so that's the first thing you want to look at. If you're at the beach, um, maybe you're at Gandhi Boulevard, um, kind of on that causeway there, that's a really good spot to see a lot of shorebirds in the winter and a um, really good place to practice trying to identify shorebirds because the beach is so short there, you're kind of really close to a lot of these shorebirds. A lot of times you can get pretty close to them uh, because they're used to people, they're used to fishermen. And so you can kind of put yourself right in the middle of a whole bunch of shorebirds there. And so um, actually a lot of these, a lot of these pictures, I, I think I took at Gandhi uh, Beach there. Yeah, both of this black bellied plover definitely was. So the first thing I want you to do when you're out there, you're seeing a lot of these birds on the beach, how big is it relative to the others? And then the next question I want you to ask is, does it have a little black collar? This is especially applicable for those little guys, little sandpipers and plovers, because when they have these black rings around their neck or black facial markings, like all of these guys have here, then that probably means it's a plover rather than a sandpiper. So if we go back one, this guy on the bottom left here, that's a sandpiper. It's got no little black markings around his neck or head or anything like that. But these guys are all different plovers. We've got the snowy plover, piping plover, semi-palmated plover, and the killdeer, which is a type of plover. A lot of these plovers have these kind of black markings. And so that'll be one way to kind of separate the sandpipers from the plovers. Um, and once you have it down, if it has these black markings on the head and neck, you're only dealing with you know, four, five, six species that are possible in Florida. It narrows it down very quickly just by looking at the size and whether it has this black collar. Now, the next question that you want to ask to identify some of these guys, is the bill long or short? Which can be difficult when the birds are asleep. Uh, but hopefully, you know, you watch them long enough, you'll realize, you know, one of them will wake up, one of them will start preening or feeding. And you can see, okay, maybe it's got a really long bill. Oh, maybe it's kind of a medium length bill. If it's a really short bill, again, if we back up, these plovers, they generally have much shorter bills than things like sandpipers. Um, and then the next thing, once you kind of have your bill size category, is is that bill curved or straight? Because um, there's kind of a, a whole continuum of curved and straight bills. And then there's one, uh, one bird in Florida that 
kind of bucks the whole, you know, is it curved down or is it straight thing and makes it very easy to identify. The recurved <laughs> bill, the American Avocet, it's kind of this one, this one uh, shorebird with a bill that curves back upward that makes it very easy to identify. It's pretty much the only bird around that's going to look like that. Um, but even, you know, of the, the bills that are mostly straight, you know, some of them can have a slight droop to them. This guy here is called a Dunlin. It's one of the sandpipers around that's going to have this slight droop to the bill. And so here's a breeding plumage one with a nice black belly. It's very easy to identify a Dunlin when it's in breeding plumage. It's the only guy with the black belly. In the fall and winter, they look more like this, very drab, very brown, gray, very difficult to identify until you notice that slightly drooping bill. And that's actually pretty diagnostic. If you see a little tiny shorebird that's kind of brown and white, you know, kind of a relatively long bill, you know, that's a lot of shorebirds. But if that long bill has this little droop to it, instead of being perfectly straight, it's a good, good clue that you're looking at a Dunlin as opposed to something like a willet, kind of medium-sized shorebird, a little bit bigger, perfectly straight bill. These willets, you're not gonna see a willet with a bill that's curved up or down, sideways, anything like that. Um, you know, and so looking at the, so we've got the size of the, bir the bird, whether it has any black markings on its neck to kind of get it into the plover category, the length of the bill, and then whether the bird has a curved bill. Um, you know, mostly very drooping down for things like curlews and wimbrels, curving up for the avocet. Um, and pop quiz here, are there any birds that have bills that curve sideways rather than up and down? And on, you know, as a second little follow-up question, why would that evolve? Um, so put in the chat, if you think you know of any birds that have sideways curving bills, <laughs> Um, it's kind of an interesting category here. Got a couple of numbers coming up in the chat here. Let's see if this, let's see, we've got, okay. So we've got a couple of, of answers that are, that are on the right track. So one answer was a turnstone. So the ready turnstone, that one, it uses its bill to flip over stones and it is, it's a conver kind of a convergent evolution sort of thing here. The, um, the turnstone, it does the same motion of the bird in question here. Um, shrikes have bills you know, that kind of have a hook on the end, so it curves down, not to the side. Oyster catchers, very nice straight bills. They're very thin, so they can kind of plunge down into sand and things like that. Um, cross bills, you know, both bills are curving a little bit to the side. That is you know, what I was expecting, you know, people to think of crossbills because they're in North America. Um, but kind of, you know, I think, you know, that kind of cancels out if they're curving both ways. The real, oh, one person got it. Um, congrats to Joe Hubbard there. I was not expecting anybody to guess the rye bill. This is a bird from New Zealand and it has a bird that always, it has a bill that always curves to the right. And it uses its bill in the same way that the turnstones do. It kind of reaches down into the rocks and it uses this bill to feed, here's a rock on the bugs underneath the rock without having like the turnstone would have a straight bill and it would flip a rock over. It can kind of feed under the rock using this bill. So I'm really impressed that uh, anybody knew what this bird was. It's a really cool looking bird. Not one you're gonna see in Florida. If you do, let me know. I would love to, <laughs> I would love, I would fly in to Florida to, uh, to see that bird if it showed up from New Zealand. Um, and then going back to, um, you know, just the general shorebirds, once you have your categories broken down and you've got, let's say you've got a small bird, doesn't have any black markings around the neck, it's got kind of a medium length straight bill. That's a, you know, that's a pretty large category. There's a lot of these little sandpipers out there um, in a category we call peeps. They're kind of these, these small brown and gray shorebirds. Um, and there's a group of them that all look pretty similar. And some of them are so similar, you have to look at just like the slight color variations and the edges of the feathers of the wings. You know, this is not my picture here. This is a semi-palmated sandpiper, which is very common. Um, you'll, you know, you'll see plenty of these, but if you sort through 
thousands and thousands of them. If you get lucky, maybe you'd find one little stint, which is a vagrant from Europe based just on the rustiness of the feathers. Um, but, you know, that's, you know, that's kind of going really deeply into shorebird ID more, more so than I even care to do generally. Um, but here at this, you know, looking at these graphs of, you know, what birds are where throughout the year, like we did earlier, here are all the shorebirds that you can find in Florida kind of throughout the year. And a lot of them are only there during migration or during the winter. But if just looking at the numbers, you know, the, the main thing here that I'm trying to get across is look at this. We've got, you know, five, six species of plovers. We've got wimbrels and curlews. We've got turnstones, knots, sandpipers, yellow legs. There's tons of these species of shorebirds. But if you use my, my you know, maybe four questions of how to break down the shorebirds, then you can break them into these kind of manageable chunks of maybe only four or five species to try and look at in the field guide. Our next group that we want to try and ID, way fewer species to have to deal with, but can be quite tricky nonetheless, are the white herons and the egrets. Um, and so here we've got, you know, a bunch of things that can superficially look similar. It can be kind of tricky at first. You've got cattle egrets, snowy egret, great egret, that pesky little blue heron in its juvenile plumage. And then we can also have reddish egrets and great blue herons can be pure white, especially in South Florida. There are populations, they're not albino, they still have pigments in their skin, um, but they can be pure white in plumage. It's just a different sort of mutation uh, where they have whole, there's populations of them out there and that just adds to the confusion. But the questions I want you to ask to identify those white herons, overall size, again, that's a big one. If you're seeing a wading bird and it's a little tiny white wading bird, Really, you should only be thinking of snowy egrets, cattle egrets, maybe that little blue heron. You know, the big, you know, there's big, long, elegant looking ones, probably a great egret. And if it's giant with its with a huge bill, it's probably that great blue heron, even if it's white. The next thing I want you to think about after the size is the bill color and then the bill shape. You know, these guys, they generally all have pretty long pointy bills, but there is actually a bit of variation. If you were to look really closely at just the snowy egret and just the little blue heron. That's what we have here. The snowy egret, it's got these yellow lures around the eye. It's got a black bill that's long and straight and pointy. The little blue heron, it just looks less elegant. Somehow it's got, you know, this bigger eye without the nice yellow here. It doesn't have these nice floofy feathers on the back of its head and its chest. Its bill's drooping down a little bit. It's a bit thicker. It's not this nice, sharp, pointy bill, and it's also bicolored. It's not pure black. So there are these little ways where if you get a good picture um, or, you know, maybe you sketch it or you just have a good memory of a bird, of a heron that you saw, if you can remember what its head looked like and what its bill looked like, you have a pretty good chance that you'll be able to ID it later on. Um, but yeah, it does take some practice to ID these in the field. Um, but once you see them enough, it'll become second nature. You know, you'll see this thicker, slightly droopier bill and you'll just know, oh, that's, that's not one of the egrets. That's just a young little blue heron. Okay. Another group, um, that can be annoying on the shore, uh, are going to be the gulls and terns. You know, there's a lot of them that can look very similar again. And, you know, this, we're going to go a little bit faster through these guys, even though they've got a bunch of questions to ask to figure them out. But you can always, you know, you can go back at this lecture. It'll be recorded. It'll be on Facebook. Um, but the main things you want to ask, any black on the head, same thing, bill, the bill shape, the bill size. If it, is it really pointy, really long and pointy like a turn, or is it a little bit thicker, more cosmopolitan, more kind of general scavengy sort of bill like a gull. Um, and then you want to look at the color of the bill on the feet and then the color of the wingtips. And with these questions, you can break down these, these gulls and terns, which are all very similar gray and white sort of birds. Um, and you can identify pretty much all of them using just these questions here. So we've got a gull or tern here. We've got a black head. The whole head is black, not just a crest. So that's telling us in Florida, that alone is probably telling us it's a laughing gull. And then again, red bill, red feet, slightly shorter bill. It's pointy, but it's not super long and pointy. That's kind of telling us it's a gull. 
Okay, here we've got another bird. It doesn't have a black head though. Um, we've got a shorter, you know, kind of a short bill. It's a little pointy, but it's not super sharp. That again is telling us we've got a gull rather than a turn like this guy here. We've got a turn with a very long pointy bill. These guys are often like plunge diving for fish. They use those really long pointy bills for that. Um, and so having that long pointy bill really points to it being a turn rather than a gull. And then if you got the craziest bill of all, the black skimmer with its lower mandible longer than the top, that one's an easy ID uh, because it's the only bird around with a lower mandible that's gonna be longer than the top. Okay, our last kind of group of tricky birds are gonna be these songbirds. And the first thing that we want to find out is we kind of want to identify it to family. Um, so the first thing we want to figure out is is it a warbler, a vireo, or is it a gnat catcher? These are kind of the three general groups of songbirds that you'll notice, especially you know, flying around in the treetops um, in the fall and winter. And if you can identify whether it's a warbler, a vireo, or a gnat catcher, that'll make a huge difference in trying to identify it down to species later. It'll make it much easier. And uh, to do this, we want to look at most of the overall body shape but then also the bill shape and the tail length relative to the body. So with that overall body shape, is it a really thin and long bird or is it a bit more chunky? That bill, is it kind of pointy, thin and long or is it a little bit shorter, stouter and hooked? Uh, and then that tail length, is it a short tail or is it a really, really long tail, almost the whole length of the body? Who's that Pokemon? So who do we have here? We've got a short tail, we've got a chunky bird, we've got a short bill with a hook on the end. Those are all telling us it's probably a vireo. We've got a blue-headed vireo here. And so vireos, um, they have this little hook on their bill. If you can get a good enough look to see that hook, then uh, that's an easy ID uh, to be a vireo right there. The warblers are more pointy bills, gnat catchers, same pointy, um, so that thick, hooked bill and a short tail with kind of a plump looking body. Um, that'll help you ID as a vireo. Here's another vireo, looks a little bit longer, but again, we've got a thick hooked bill and a short tail. And same here, thick hooked bill, relatively small tail, kind of a big body and a really big head on this one. These are all vireos. Compare those to this guy here. We've got a pointy bill, got kind of a thinner body with a much longer tail relative to the body length. This one here is a gnat catcher. Um, and another interesting thing with gnat catchers, a uh, good ID feature is those outer tail feathers are white and they often will show that they're, all, they're very active foragers. Gnat catchers will be jumping around, there'll be a tiny bird hopping around and you'll see those, those tail feathers flaring out and those outer retrices, the outer tail feathers are going to have white on them. And that'll help you ID it as a gnat catcher. Um, and I'm kind of focusing on the gnat catcher because they're very common. And I feel like half, of, half the time when you're looking at a little songbird in the top of a tree in Florida in the winter, it's gonna be a gnat catcher. Now, the other more, most common thing around is a palm warbler, this species of warbler here. We've got kind of a medium length tail, you know, nice sharp pointy bill here, um, kind of that yellow color. Almost all the warblers around are gonna have some sort of yellow mustardy sort of color to them. Um, but the body shape can actually be a little bit tough to use if they are preening or kind of standing in a weird angle. So here uh, we've got a few different angles of the same, you know, species as palm warbler. And look how different it can look if it's got its wings spread out or if it's kind of preening and it's all fluffed up or if it's just kind of standing like normal here, it's admiring its own reflection in the car. Um, these, these three are all the same species, the palm warbler. Um, but you know, if you recognize that it's got all this yellow on it, it's got this kind of sharp bill, uh, it's got this rusty sort of crown here, those are all good ways to know, okay, we're dealing with a warbler. Now, which warblers are gonna be common in Florida in the winter? And that's just a much smaller number to deal with. Uh, one other one that's possible in Florida in the winter, you know, here we've got this mu brown mustard color with some streaks. Here we've got more of a lemony yellow color, no streaks. This is a yellow warbler. You know, so we've got a couple different species of warblers. Um, they're similar, 
But once you know the different features, once you can identify that you're dealing with a warbler rather than a vireo or a gnat catcher, just based on the size and shape, um, once you know you're dealing with a warbler, there's way fewer species to have to deal with in that field guide. Here's maybe the last of the common warblers that you'll see around uh, Florida in the wintertime, the yellow rumped warbler, um, much more brown and streaky, not much yellow. But again, we've got a sharp, a pointy bill rather than a hooked bill. So we're not dealing with a vireo here. And in this angle, it's tough to see, or it's impossible to see, but it would have a yellow rump and kind of a medium length tail, not as long and thin as a gnat catcher's tail, um, not as short and stubby as a vireo's tail. So that's kind of just, you know, asking, you just, it, <laughs> it just takes a little bit of knowing which questions to ask when you first see a bird in the field to really narrow it down. You don't need to go, okay, Florida has 500 species of birds possible, which one am I looking at right here? You know, if you know what habitat you're in and you know the general size and shape of the bird, try and get it down to a family level ID first. Is it a warbler? Is it a heron? Is it a gull or a tern? And once you're dealing with that, it's a much more manageable number uh, to, to really deal with. So that's the first, you know, that's the main thing with today's talk that I want you to take away is to not try to just go in and identify everything to species immediately just off the top of your head. Try and categorize things that you see in the field as a wading bird, a songbird, a raptor, and then pay particular attention to a few little field marks like the beak um, size and shape um, and maybe how it's behaving, what, what habitat it's in. Um, and that will, will be much more reliable as a way to identify down to species than trying to just memorize everything. And it's also much more transferable. If you, if you travel abroad, all of a sudden, all these birds that you learned in Florida might not be there anymore. They're, you know, all of this information seems useless if you've just memorized exactly what birds are in Florida. But if you memorize instead how to identify at a family level and you know, how to identify a songbird versus a, you know, a wading bird, things like that, that's something that'll translate and will be useful no matter where you're birding around the world. Um, so with that, I would definitely love to take any questions. Um, and yeah, I'm, you know, I know I went over a lot of information pretty quickly there. I'd be happy to go back to any slides, happy to elaborate on anything. Um, and I'm happy to do any, you know, extra research and then maybe put it in a comment. Um, if you have, you know, more in-depth questions, I can put it in a comment in the, in, on Facebook underneath where this is, uh, being shared and streamed. Thank you, Brian. That was awesome. Um, that helped me sort out those songbirds. Um, so yeah, if anyone has any questions, now is the time to put them in the Q&A box. Um, our first question, Brian, is um, what's the major method to explore avian fauna of a certain area? Um, so I would say of a certain area, um, so I guess there's a couple different ways of looking at that. You could mean like you want to go to Brooker Creek and you want to explore the avifauna of Brooker Creek, or do you want to explore, you know, just in general, like the birds of Florida? I'd say both, for both, I would say the first step I would do would be to go to that website I mentioned, ebird.org, and look at the hotspots um, and species maps. And that way you can get a sense of what birds are being seen, what are common, what are around. And then also, you know, having a field guide, you know, I, even this digital age, I like having a physical field guide, a book. Um, you know, I like the Sibley guide uh, to birds, either of North America or of Eastern North America. Um, and just kind of start looking through the birds um, that are in whatever area you're interested in. But then really the big thing and the funnest thing is to just go out there and, you know, just get outside. You'll learn a lot more just going outside, even just randomly, take a walk down the street, look at some retention ponds, look in some random piece of woods, uh, walk around Brooker Creek down the boardwalk. It'll just be more fun, but you'll also learn a lot more by being out there. And so, um, you know, maybe you realize, okay, you're hearing all these different sounds and now you want to figure out what those specific birds are. Um, and so the first step is really getting outside and figuring out what you're interested in. Are you interested in seeing every last bird and listing them all? 
you're interested in taking pictures of them. You know, it's kind of, it's a broad, big world, <laughs> a lot to explore out there. Wonderful, thank you. Um, the next question is, when you had that rye bill up, um, they asked, is it related to the plover since it has the black collar? Yes, that is a good call. Yeah, uh, phylogenetically, it is definitely in there related with the plovers. Yep, and you can see everything about it looked a lot like like a snowy plover or a piping plover other than the, the weird bill shape. It's a bird that would be, be very cool to see. It's on my bucket list. <laughs> I looked super cool. Thank you. Those are all the questions I'm seeing right now. So if anyone has any more, now is the time to put them in. Um, and I did want to mention that we do offer birding hikes here at the Brooker Creek Preserve. Um, we do one on the first Sundays, which is actually led by um, Miss Jo Hubbard, who got that that question right. And then we also do one on fourth Saturday. So that would be November 27th this month. And we did just get a question in quickly. Um, let me check it. Could you talk about the yellow feet in bills as it relates to the herons and the egrets? Sure. Um, so I don't think the feet are in this picture back here of the herons. Yeah, and no, I cut off, cut off the feet there. Um, so one thing that is useful, um, the yellow feet of the snowy egret. That can be a useful ID feature. The snowy egrets have these yellow legs, or sorry, black legs, but yellow feet. Um, and they're pretty much the only ones that really have that, um, that kind of color combo. And so the feet color can be useful there uh, for identifying the snowy egret specifically from other things. Uh, one reason I don't like to use the feet color as much um, to rely on, one, because the legs are often underwater, and also, if their feet are really muddy, especially from a distance, it can be really tough to tell when you've got yellow feet versus black feet or brown feet. You know, if they're if they're wandering around in the mud flats, all the feet might look the same. Um, and so, it's definitely true that's a good ID feature for snowy egret. Um, but I would say a much more reliable, consistent uh, feature to focus on, at least for me and what I like to to look at, are is the head and the bill shape. I feel like. Um, that's, it, it's, you know, just as reliable as using the, the feet color and it's, it's pretty much always visible, whereas the feet can often be hidden. Awesome, thank you. And it looks like that's it for us. Um, thank you so much, Brian. It's always a pleasure to have you. And that was such a thorough, well done presentation. We really appreciate your time and your expertise. And thank you everyone for tuning in and joining us on a Tuesday afternoon. And if you have any follow-up questions that you think of, feel free to shoot us an email and we'll be happy to help you out with that. So I hope everyone has a great rest of their day. Thanks for coming. Thanks. Bye.